This is Nightly Business Report with Sue Herrera and Bill Griffin. A week to forget. The NASDAQ and the S&P have their worst week of the year as trade war fears ding investor confidence. New ingredient, and with those trade fears threatening to drag on well into the future, investors may have to start factoring in trade when making decisions. So what should you do? And wouldn't that be nice? An app for cutting down commute times. Meet the entrepreneurs who think they're on to something. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, August the 2nd. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Everybody has a bad day now and again, and some more than others. The same is true for stocks, and this was quite a week. Ongoing fears over a trade war with China sent stocks lower. The Nasdaq and the S&P 500 were off more than 3 percent this week. The Nasdaq just about 4. It was the worst week of the year for those indexes, and the better than 2.5 percent loss for the Dow marked its second worst week of 2019. As for today, the Dow lost 98 points to 26,485. The Nasdaq dropped 107, and the S&P was off 21. Actually, a trade deal was reached today, one that will help the nation's farmers. And while it wasn't exactly the deal that Wall Street's been waiting for, Kayla Tausche tells us it is still connected to the tensions with China. Frustrated with a lack of progress in China talks, President Trump went to the Roosevelt Room to announce a deal with Europe, boosting U.S. beef sales and benefiting a key group of supporters. My administration is standing up for our farmers and ranchers like never before. We're protecting our farmers. We're doing it in many ways, including with China. Farmers have been the target of China's retaliation so far. The administration has repaid them $28 billion. Today, the Chinese government said it would retaliate further if the U.S. goes through with the new tariffs. Two executives who declined to be named for fear of further retaliation said China could revoke licenses, launch cyber attacks, or spring surprise audits on them. Consumer trade groups say tariffs haven't worked and will only lead to higher prices on everything from electronics to clothing. NEC director Larry Kudlow dismissed that view, saying the impact would be small. People worry about the impact on consumers and so forth. Um, as I've said in the past, any consumer impact is very, very small, minuscule. A senior administration official tells me that if China can deliver positive action between now and September 1st, President Trump may reconsider. Though Trump had that same outlook back in May when he announced the last tariff hike on China, and he went through with it anyway when Chinese officials didn't deliver. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Kayla Tausche at the White House. And late this afternoon, the president did say that tariffs on EU autos are never off the table. And also the U.K.'s Telegraph newspaper is reporting that the White House is warning Britain that it will not get a free trade deal unless a new tax affecting U.S. tech companies is dropped. As Kayla mentioned, China did say that it would retaliate if the U.S. imposes new tariffs. And as Eunice Yoon tells us, the government did not mince words. She's in Beijing for us. Here in China, people are using a popular Chinese saying to explain President Trump's decision. That President Trump changes his mind faster than flipping pages on a book. Chinese officials, though, haven't been as generous. The Commerce Ministry called the move a serious violation of the consensus at the G20. The country's top diplomat said that it was neither constructive nor correct. And the Foreign Ministry said that Beijing would be forced to take countermeasures. It's that last point that is really worrying American businesses in China. The U.S.-China Business Council says that its members are worried about increased regulatory scrutiny, delays in licenses and approvals, and discrimination in government procurement tenders. Retailers say American consumers will be hit hard, but Chinese manufacturers are worried, too. We spoke to factories that sell to the U.S., and they said a 10 percent tariff would be a blow to a sector that's already under strain. One manufacturer who sells Christmas gifts said that he would likely have to stop selling to the U.S. altogether. As for a trade deal, the Global Times, a Communist Party paper, said that the new tariffs would only lower the prospects of a trade deal and that Beijing will hunker down instead for a prolonged trade war. I spoke to a source who's familiar with the Chinese side's thinking, and he said that he's worried that the Chinese negotiating team won't take part in the trade talks that are set for September in the United States because to the Chinese, the trade truce is off. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Yunus Yoon in Beijing. 
And this latest round of proposed tariffs on Chinese imports have items like smartphones, apparel and toys caught in the crosshairs of the trade conflict. So what could it potentially mean for consumer spending here in the U.S., which has, of course, been a, an engine of growth for our economy? Joining us tonight is Brett Ryan. He's senior U.S. economist at Deutsche Bank. Brett, good to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Great. Thank you for having me on the program. Already one retail trade group has been out saying the consumers should look for higher prices at the back-to-school season and, of course, at the important holiday shopping season. What kind of an impact do you see happening? Well, I, could, I, could, I would agree with the, the chairman of economic advisors, uh, Mr. Kudlow, that the impact from the tariffs themselves will be uh, not very direct in terms of consumer spending. But consumer spending should slow, is expected to slow already over the back half of the year. And the issue is if the weakness in business confidence begins to affect the labor market and mm -hmm. hiring growth slows down, then that could spill over into consumer confidence later this year causing a sharper slowdown in consumer spending than what we're already expecting as the boost from tax cuts from last year continues to fade. There's also the psychological impact, is there not, on the consumer with the headline risk? We, we hear a lot about these trade tariffs, and we're hearing whether or not it ends up to be true on a meaningful basis. We hear a lot about the trickle down to the consumer. At what point does the consumer pull back based on the expectation that they will get hit? Uh, that's a very good point, Sue. And the University of Michigan survey noted today that consumers are already feeling a little bit anxious uh, about the policy uncertainty. Uh, and we could see uh, confidence begin to tick lower over the next uh, few months. Uh, and that, in turn, could have an impact in consumer spending uh, towards the end of the summer and into the back-to-school season. We've already been establishing that we have essentially two economies right now, where the consumer is strong, but businesses are holding back on investment uh, because of fears about the trade. So what you seem to be suggesting is that that it, lack of business investment or the slowdown will eventually hurt the job market, which eventually hurts the consumer. Is that what we're talking about here? Yes, that's correct. The business confidence tends to lead consumer confidence. And when we see business confidence falling as quickly as we are uh, with the manufacturing ISM and the Chicago PMI, that does not bode well for consumer confidence the longer that this persists. Brett Ryan with Deutsche Bank. Good to see you again. Thanks for joining us. Tonight. Great. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Well, the ongoing trade conflict has been happening for nearly a year now, and it's creating uncertainty in the market, as we saw today, and with investors. So what should you be doing now to factor in the trade dispute in your portfolio? Steve Masaka joins us, U.S. strategist with Wedbush. Good to see you, Steve. Welcome. Good to be here. As I mentioned, this has been going on for about a year now. And a number of analysts that we've talked to have pointed out the fact that the Chinese have a very long timeline. That's the way they tend to think. So there is no indication that this is going to end anytime soon. So how, as an individual investor, do you start to factor this into your portfolio management? Well, I don't think you want to pay a whole lot of attention to it, quite frankly. I don't think that we're going to see anything dramatic out of this administration prior to the 2020 election. So we'll see a lot of talk and a lot of chatter, but nothing that will really be all that meaningful to the market. And yes, we corrected this week because of the trade news, but you know, stocks were extended. They were also disappointed that the Fed indicated this may be the one and only rate cut that we had this week. So there were other factors involved in the decline. But our feeling is that trade policy will not be particularly negative for the market until we get past the 2020 election cycle for the obvious reason. Right. Uh, the administration's not going to want to damage their chances in the election. You know, if you're looking for investments that are maybe immune to the trade dispute, there are those who say you look to small caps, for example, since they're more focused on the domestic economy and not so much, uh, you know, affected by tariffs. Is that an area to look at? I mean, if we're looking for places uh, uh, to trying to avoid the problems of the trade conflict, is that an area to look at necessarily? Uh, absolutely. And small caps have underperformed this year. They have not had the same kind of gains that larger cap stocks have had. So it's also an area where you might find cheaper stocks. Uh, and of course, as you point out, small cap companies tend to be domestically oriented and not have exposure to international markets. 
although that's not always the case, and investors should be careful about what stocks they select because some companies do import and export even though they're small in size. What about hedging? I know you, you believe in investing heavily in equities, but would you go to any alternative investments to perhaps hedge your bets in case trade really does have an impact? We've looked at hedging very closely. We've, we've used it on occasion. We find hedging to be very expensive right now. and uh, We find it, it, it chews up a lot of your gains. So mm -hmm. quite frankly, we haven't been hedging. Um, and, and we can't really find what we think is an inexpensive way to do it. Uh, certainly, if that opportunity presented itself, it's something that you could look at. But right okay. now, we don't find hedging to be effective. Steve, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Steve Masaka with very Redbush. Very welcome. On to the labor market now, where a record run in job growth was not enough to offset trade concerns. We learned this morning that the economy added 164,000 jobs in July, essentially in line with the estimates of 165,000. Unemployment remained at 3.7 percent while wages rose. Now, this is the 106th straight month of job growth. That's the longest streak ever, with more than 163 million people working, also a record. Ilan Mui has more for us tonight. Businesses are still hiring workers at a steady pace, but not as fast as they were before. Job growth in July was slower than in June, and the Labor Department lowered its estimate for that month as well. May's number was revised down too. Wage growth also leveled off in July. Average hourly earnings were up $0.08 cents to $27.98, on par with the gain in June. The White House said those are all positive indicators. It was a very good jobs report. Uh, people are flooding back into the job market. That tells me not only is the economy strong with a low unemployment rate, but because of the increase in salaries and wages and compensation, people are coming back. But manufacturing appears to be cooling off. The Labor Department reported that job growth in the industry has been markedly slower than last year. The sector added a solid 16,000 jobs in July, but the average for the year is half that. The manufacturing work week fell to 40.4 hours in July, the lowest level since 2011. Meanwhile, the retail industry also continued to struggle. It shed 3,600 jobs in July, the sixth consecutive month of declines. But there were still plenty of bright spots. Professional and technical services, healthcare and social assistance, all those industries added jobs. And the labor force participation rate edged up from 62.9 to 63 percent. Almost all of the increase in participation rate came from black teens and um, those with less than a high school degree. And that's really important because it means we're pulling in people who were formerly not re-engaged in this economy. Analysts say a slowdown in job growth should be expected. The unemployment rate is hovering around historic lows, which means there are simply fewer workers for hire. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Ilan Mui in Washington. Up next, women taking flight. I'm Jane Wells in Anchorage, Alaska. When's the last time you heard a female voice on an airplane come on and say, this is your captain speaking? Not much. Only 6% of the pilots at the major airlines in America are women. But the world needs pilots. Where are the females? We come here to one of the top flight schools in the country, owned and operated by a woman. That's coming up. Over the next two decades, it's estimated that hundreds of thousands of pilots will be needed worldwide. And many of the major airlines are making their pitch to have women be the leaders in the cockpit. Jane Wells has more from Anchorage, Alaska. <laughs> On an airstrip in Anchorage, Alaska, is one of the top flight schools in the country. Owned and operated by a woman who started a flight school after the one she was working at didn't like her style. I sold my car for $8,000 and I renovated this building and um, I had people knocking on my door from day one. Ground Cessna 734, Quebec Mike. Jamie Patterson Sims of Skytrack Alaska has been recognized as an FAA Gold Seal flight instructor. 
Yet women in the cockpit remain something of an oddity. Only about 6% of the pilot force at the top three airlines are female. And that surprises Beverly Bass, hired by American Airlines in 1976 and its first female captain. Well, you know, we talk about that all the time. And I think for the most part, women are just still not aware that that is a job opportunity that is available to them. Boeing estimates the global aviation industry will need 800,000 new pilots over the next 20 years. Men like Jesse Heffley and women like Madison Minnick, both taking lessons here in Anchorage with a female instructor. She doesn't let me get away with anything, which I appreciate. My mom runs a huge native corporation up here, and so I am super used to women telling me what to do. All three major U.S. airlines have stepped up pilot recruiting, targeting women specifically with financial aid for flight school. And this is an industry with no gender pay gap. Pay is based purely on things like the type of aircraft flown. But surveys by Embry-Riddle suggest passengers still are not as comfortable with women in the cockpit as men. And Beverly Bass, who has seen it all, says women pilots are no better or worse than men, but they can multitask. I know that I could cook dinner, feed a baby, and talk on the telephone all at the same time. She hopes a new generation of women will love flying as much as she has, each with her own favorite part of the experience. Probably when the wheels lift off, when you first rotate the plane and you just kind of hover for a second, it's just the coolest feeling ever. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Jane Wells in Anchorage, Alaska. Exxon Mobil gets a lift from north of the border, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus with the energy giant topping expectations as strength in its exploration and production division offset weak results from its refining operation. The company also benefited from a tax rate change in Canada. Shares were down a fraction today to 71.75. And to Exxon Mobil's rival Chevron, which reported mixed results, it beat earnings expectations but fell short on revenue. Companies saw an increase in oil production and a termination fee that it received after it lost the bidding war for Anadarko actually added $720 million to its bottom line. Stock was down a fraction to 120.73. Meanwhile, IBM is lowering its earnings forecast for the year now that its deal to buy a software company Red Hat has closed. That $34 billion acquisition was the largest in IBM's history. And executives said that an accounting adjustment related to it is going to reduce its earnings by roughly a dollar a share this year. The stock fell more than 2 percent to 147.25. Investor Carl Icahn is taking a more than 12 percent stake in the data analytics company Cloudera. Icahn says he plans to meet with Cloudera's management to increase its shareholder value. Regulatory filings also say Icon may be looking for seats on the company's board. The stock rose almost 4 percent to 660. NetApp is warning its current quarter results will come in well below expectations, partly due to a decline in enterprise software license renewals and what it calls a weak macroeconomic environment. The data storage company did say it remains confident in its long-term strategy but cut its fiscal 2020 outlook. Shares plummeted more than 20 percent to 46.04. And Campbell Soup has sold its Arnott's cookie business and other international assets to the private equity firm KKR for more than $2 billion. Campbell's was up a fraction today to 4234 CBS and Viacom have reportedly reached a working agreement on who will lead the combined company if a merger is approved. The Wall Street Journal says CBS's acting chief executive would oversee all of CBS's branded assets, while the head of Viacom would take the CEO role of the proposed combined company. CBS shares were down a fraction to 50-40. Viacom shares were also off a fraction at 29.78. Now to this week's market monitor who has the names of three well-known global companies that he believes have good prospects for growth in the future. Alan Bond is back with us. He's co-manager of the Jensen Quality Growth Fund. Alan, good to see you again. Welcome back. Hi. And we start with Johnson & Johnson. Now we all know about the talc-related lawsuits that it faces down the road. As it happens late this afternoon, a jury in Kentucky found in favor of Johnson & Johnson. Uh, but that's only one of tens of thousands of lawsuits that it still faces. And I assume you don't feel it's a big overhang on this company. Yes, yeah, so, so Johnson & Johnson, obviously a well-known healthcare business with uh, a wide range of global businesses. We think all poised to grow due to an aging population globally 
and developments in pharmaceutical research. And the stock has been a bit weak this year due in part to the litigation issues that you mentioned, uh, also due to concerns about drug price reform. But, uh, you know, we think Johnson & Johnson is one of the most financially strong businesses in the world and in really naturally resilient business that can manage its way through. And we think this is a good opportunity, uh, this pullback, uh, to, add to the, add to the position for long-term investors. Your next pick is 3M. Uh, not only is it a global pick, but you like the dividend. Yeah, so 3M, a global industrial conglomerate, a wide range of businesses supported by competitive advantages in terms of manufacturing expertise and technological developments. Uh, it's a business that is uh, a bit sensitive to changes in the economy, and we've seen the slowdown in China hit both the business and the shares so far this year. Uh, we think for the long term, this is a company with a good dividend. Uh, it's got a good track record of managing through headwinds, and we've taken the, the, the pullback in the shares as an opportunity to add to our position in the fund. And your third pick is Omnicom, the global advertising and marketing firm. I mean, when you think about it, social media, that advertising is the lifeblood of many of those companies, right? Yeah, so you know, Omnicom, global media and advertising firm, uh, really supported by a longstanding reputation for creative excellence. And um, we have seen uh, increasing competition enter Omnicom's business. That's resulted in some uncertainty about top-line growth. Uh, but we think the company's been doing a very good job of executing through these headwinds. They've taken share from traditional competitors. Uh, they've managed profitability very well, and, and things like social media are a very good growth driver for a company like Omnicom. So, again, uh, we think an example of a high-quality stock trading at an attractive price. There you are. Alan Bond with Jensen Quality Growth Fund. Good to see you again. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you. Coming up, the high-tech way a pair of entrepreneurs hopes to help you streamline your commute. Reducing travel times, particularly for rail and bus users, could be a $60 billion global economic bonus each year. But what's the best way to do that? Well, one way, empower riders with the information they need to get where they're going more efficiently. And that's why a pair of Washington, D.C. entrepreneurs got the bright idea to make your mobility their business. In 2008 and 9, Matt Kaywood spent many grad school nights in a San Francisco lab researching AI and neuroscience. But getting home meant guesswork. Which of several buses might show up first? That type of information was not yet widely available. When they first produced real-time live information, I, I realized that that could, you know, solve my problem. I'd never have to wait out in the fog again. But uh, the problem was there wasn't a single place to get it all. In his free time, Kaywood began developing a platform to get it all. Buses, rails, car services like Uber and Lyft, bikes and scooters too. In 2013, he was working in Washington, D.C. when he took a prototype to a mentoring group for entrepreneurs. And that's where he met Ryan Croft, a tour company owner whose travels had taken him to 50 countries and 100 cities. They all have poor traffic. Information is king. If you give people information at the time that they need it, they can make an informed decision. They began bootstrapping a business, Transit Screen. If I press this, will it give me a location? Along the way, the former U.S. president took notice at a startup incubator. And in 2015, Transit Screen went live, sharing information at first from San Francisco and the D.C. area. We're driving them customers and we're giving them a better experience. In return, they don't charge us and we don't charge them. Now Transit Screen digests more than 2,000 feeds from 60 cities around the world, 24 hours a day. How often are these trains coming? Are there a lot of Ubers and bike shares and scooters nearby in the proximity of that uh, building? If it's coming in four minutes, maybe I walk straight there. If it's uh, longer, maybe I'll decide that I want to stop and grab a coffee. Who pays for their service? Everybody seems to use them. Real estate developers and leasing agents like Tristan Frey. Of course, because it's all about location, location, location. Transit Screen won't say exactly what they charge, only that it's usually a few hundred dollars a month 
per screen, and they're in roughly 1,500 buildings across the country. It is definitely a major selling point as I'm taking people to, to look at the building. They're always like, oh, wow, that's super, super useful. Now there's also an app for that called City Motion, and this year a new revenue stream. Many big companies provide employees shuttle services, and some are paying to help their employees choose a route that's right for them. It's an amenity for employees but it's actually necessity for companies. We just kept hearing the story over and over again about the pain of turnover. We're right on top of a metro station ourselves here. Why? Because we want to be close to our employees. Lots of those big companies are multinationals, so Transit Screen, already on track to bring in between it. four and eight Looks million like dollars in sales in 2019, is planning to expand into 14 European cities beginning later this year. For Kay Wood and Croft, Time really is money. It's a very scalable business and it's an endless ocean of companies out there and we're just now sort of in the first inning or two of this long game. And as transportation becomes more data driven, Transit Screen is also working on the Open Mobility Data Initiative, aiming to get transit systems on the same page when it comes to data formats so their information can get to the rest of us more smoothly. Truly a bright idea. Mm -hmm. Before we go, a final look at the day on Wall Street. The Dow lost just 98 points. It was down much more than that earlier. NASDAQ dropped by 107. The S&P was off by 21. And yes, it was the worst week of the year for the NASDAQ and the S&P as the month of August gets underway. That is the Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Bill Griffith. Thanks for watching. It's a good thing it's Friday. Yeah. I'm Sue Herrera. Have a great weekend. And we will see you right back here on Monday.